Welcome to the Dynamic Radiologist Podcast, where we feature leading experts in healthcare. And now here's your host, Dr. Stephen Brownstein. Hello, Dr. Stephen Brownstein here. I am the host of Dynamic Radiologist Podcast. Through this platform, I have the great honor to interview top leaders in health and in business to discuss what they're doing to change the world. Some of the amazing guests I have interviewed include Dr. Jeffrey Crump, CEO of Smile Kinetics, Smart Injury Doctors, the Smart Injury Lawyers, Dr. Mike Carberry, CEO of Advanced Medical Integration, Dr. Donald DeFabio, and Howard Reese, CEO of the Teledentist. This episode is brought to you by Dynamic Medical Imaging. I started this organization 16 years ago, and I've ex- experienced consistent growth and opportunity ever since. We have the only phonar upright MRI in central and northern New Jersey. We've had patients consistently coming to our center from over 20 miles away. Over 25% of our patients are either claustrophobic or have failed to have their MRIs completed in a closed unit. They have come here, have their studies performed in the phonar upright MRI. We have had over 3,000 doctors from New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania refer their patients to us. What is really telling, though, is that those same doctors who've referred their families and friend, friends have come themselves to have their own studies performed. Please check out our testimonial comment and interviews on our website, www.dynamicmedicalimaging.com, and see for yourself what your fellow patients have said about their great experience at Dynamic Medical Imaging. Our second, second sponsor today is uh, Spinal Kinetics. Uh, which I started over 10 years ago. We help medical providers of all specialties evaluate for the presence, location, and severity of spinal ligament injuries. If you do stress radiographs in any format, then you can send them to our trained doctors who use our specialty uh, technology. Spinal Connects developed a technology called CRMA, or Computerized Radiographic Menstruation Analysis, which is an advanced X-ray measurement technology to accurately measure the exact abnormal motion problems that occur with a spinal ligament injury. If you have any questions, go to www.thespinalconnects.com or email support at thespinalconnects.com. Well, today I had the great pleasure of interviewing one of my close friends, Dr. Oshadar. I've known him for close to 20 years and not only being a great chiropractor and great physician, he's a great person too. And he has a pretty good golf game too. So, Dr. Oshadar, welcome. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Brownstein. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, my pleasure, too. So let me tell the audience about your, your background. Uh, Dr. X, as we refer to him, graduated from Sony, Stony Brook uh, with a bachelor's degree in science, got his chiropractic degree at Life University, is a diplomat at American Academy of Pain Management. He's licensed to practice in New York and New Jersey. He's been a team chiropractor at Manhattanville College. He owns uh, two clinics in New Jersey, Advanced Medical and Neck Care, New Jersey, Excalibur Chiropractic. Uh, He does IME and peer reviews since 2008. He's a member of the American Academy of Spine Physicians, American Academy of Pain Management, American Academy of MUA Physicians, and American Board of Disability Physicians. He's uh, uh, doing research on diffusion tensor injury, in, injury on traumatic brain in, uh, injuries. Uh, he's an expert witness and peer review uh, physician for New York and New Jersey. He's uh, attended or taken over 40 CME credits in all areas of uh, chiropractic and imaging. Uh, and he's a, a true uh, great doctor and uh, patients love him. So good morning again, sir. Thank you. I, I, that, that's a tremendous intro, Stephen. I hopefully, I, hopefully, I can live up to those expectations. Well, listen, I, I know you can because you already have, and and I can vouch for that. So, you know, I, I ask all, all the chiropractors that I've interviewed, uh, why did you become a chiropractor? What got you interested? So, so the real story or the 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 television story? Which, which one do you want, Steve? I'll give you both. So basically. You know, the, the real story was that uh, 
you know, as I would say around seventh or eighth grade, so 13, 14 years old, I, I mean, I actually grew up with suffering from migraines, you know, as a youth and uh, really nothing, nothing really helped, you know, other than rest. Uh, I was on furosets, you know, uh, actually vomiting, believe it or not. So, I mean, certainly there was some sort of dietary connection to what I was doing, but I ended up seeing, uh, a, a re- I'm going to say revolutionary chiropractor when I was 13, 14 years old. His name was Gregory Bark. He was on Long Island. Uh, I hope he's still around because, uh, you know, he was, he was, he was revolutionary in a sense that the things he was doing then which of course at the time being poo-pooed by the uh, you know the traditional medical establishment are now being embraced in the functional medicine community at large. Um, and really, you know, it's funny, I look back because now I, I've been doing some training in functional medicine as well. And I, I remember the things that Greg put me on and, and the d- types of things he was trying to assess. And this is again, this is 1984, 1985, when this is, I mean, this was fringe, fringe stuff. And, uh, you know, so he helped me with my headaches, you know, occasionally, you know, once in a while you go in with a, an upper back or a neck problem and he could adjust me. And it was, it was really remarkable. And the one thing, the one takeaway I took from going to his office was the absolute <clears throat> adoring by his patients. His patients loved him. So you went to that office and of course, as a, as a kid, you, you know, You've been to the pediatrician. You see how the atmosphere is there. You go to this guy, and all of a sudden, you know, people are there waiting to see him and loving to see him. You know, it was a different experience, and to me, that was it. Really, you know, it was it was a fantastic experience. And then my my I ended up seeing another chiropractor, Dr. Kathy Bonanno, and she again she was very helpful. Different style practice, but vibrant, and her patients again. It was just there was a connection to the people that came to see her that really was attractive. Long story short, um, and here's the television story, Steve. Uh, At the time of my decision-making in college, uh, my junior year in college at the time, uh, my brother had been in dental practice for a few years. And this is a funny family story because he, he, he wasn't enjoying dentistry. So he, he kept telling me, he's like, and I always, Listen, he went to Stony Brook, so I went to Stony Brook. He was a he was a, a biology major, so I was a biology major. So inevitably, what happened was, I'm like, all right, listen, I'll be a dentist too. He's like, ah, you shouldn't be a dentist, this, that, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, all right, you know what? I guess I'll be in healthcare. I liked going to Dr. Bark. I like seeing Dr. Bonanno. I'm going to pursue this. And so I ended up pursuing chiropractic. And, you know, and, and, and it's, it's really been... You know, there's two stories to be told. And you, of course, you could, you know, being around as long as you've been seeing and talking to, to, to people like myself, there's two different sides to healthcare. There's the actual interaction with, with your patients and the, and the, and the, the positive and, and, you know, working, you know, problem solving and actually, you know, giving a damn about somebody's outcomes. And then there's the bureaucracy of, 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 of healthcare, the, the insurance and this and that and the, the med legal aspect of this, which certainly is is more more of a drain mentally and emotionally than than really I think patient care. So, you know, with the good and the bad, it's been twenty three years, Steve. You know, probably about as, as old as you are. You know what I mean? <laughs> so so inevitably, it's been a twenty three year old uh, journey, and I, I find it to be even more challenging and more rewarding. And and believe it or not. For me, I, I was kind of rejuvenated last year. And if I may tell you that story real quick, it was it was to me, you know, again, so the burdens of the bureaucracy and the business and, and just the 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 dealings and, and I've kind of positioned myself into you know a spot where I'm not really I wasn't doing as much hands-on work at the time, right? So I would pretty much manage both offices and do a lot more of the administrative stuff and really get frustrated with those things. Well, enter, enter in the pandemic and, you know, you know, obviously trying to stay open and trying to service your patients who want to still come and see you. There was a time where I had to actually get back into practice. And to me, uh, it was rewarding. I, I was seeing, you know, patients who, 
you know, absolutely, you know, you know, imagine being, you know, an 80 year old patient going to see a chiropractor twice a week for some odd weeks in the middle of a pandemic where nobody knows what's going on and, and transmission, nobody has an idea. You know, to me, to those people really, really invigorate me to say, hey, look, I remember why I'm doing this. You know, we're, we're, we're in a field to assist our fellow men and really help them along their journeys. And like I said, you know, it, it, and it was really interesting for me because during a time of gloom and despair and, and, and uncertainty, I would get myself to go to work and see patients and physically work with patients. And it was just me because I had to, my staff had, was staying home because of, of what was going on. And for me, it was really just like, wow, you know, I remember why I was doing this. So for me, one of, one of the most, you know, revitalizing things was I was treating a bunch of nurses. So a few nurses had come to me because nobody else was open and they, they were, you know, working extra shifts and so on and so forth. And, and, you know, they're thanking me like I like I was a frontline worker. I'm like, listen, I'm here. You guys are doing, you know, you guys are doing nitty gritty. You know, you guys are dealing with, you know, this this insane healthcare crisis. I'm just here to support you. And to me, like I said, that was that was remarkable because it really made me feel like I remember why I'm here. So there, there you have it. There's my there's my 10 minute diatribe into why I'm, I'm I am who I am. Oh, it's it's uh, you know, I've interviewed and I've been around chiropractors since 1980, and 95 percent of them have either one or two stories why they went into chiropractic. Either they had a family member, or they had their own personal interaction with chiropractors and i remember when i had to sit before the medical board they said why do you like chiropractors so much they said because they make patients better <laughs> it didn't go over too well but um no it's uh you know it, it's a profession to be admired and i think uh, especially during the pandemic uh majority of chiropractors were still open both in new york and new jersey and uh, I think that will lead to more uh, patients using seeking chiropractic care. Uh, and, uh, you know, so that's, that's cool. So um, you mentioned medical legal and chiropractic. And um, before we get into the medical legal, let's talk more about um, the, the medical end of it. You know, a patient gets injured in a motor vehicle accident and they come to your office, how do you evaluate the patient to see the, you know, the severity of their injuries? Well, I mean, first and foremost, you know, I, I am also one of these old school practitioners who values that initial examination. So that ex initial examination is, is critical into assessing where the patient's at. And of course, the, the probably one of the most important things is, of course, the, the history of the patient, their medical, you know, what kind of medical history they have and the history of the trauma. And then going into the physical examination, you know, whether it's the range of motions of the, uh, the spine and, and assessing the movement patterns of the spine, as well as the neurological functions, the orthopedic functions, you know, these things, I mean, I, I am... I am one of these guys who takes 25 minutes to, to evaluate a patient to make sure I know what's going on and what other specialties can be, you know, need to be triaged in the management of this patient's care. And, you know, I'll give you a perfect example. I had a, I had a fellow last night who somehow was uh, discharged from the hospital with a distal clavicle fracture that was completely separated. So, the funny part is on physical exam, because he wasn't sure what they told him, and I can't imagine it because his x-rays were night and day clear. Uh, it looked like he had a step defect with his AC joint, right? So I'm, I'm thinking, okay, they, have, they weren't clear, so maybe they just didn't tell him it was separated. Maybe a grade two separation, whatever. He had a step defect. And lo and behold, I look at his x-rays later on that evening. I'm like you got to see an orthopedic surgeon right away. I don't know how they let him go. So, you know, again, it's that little extra care, a little extra time you take that really makes the difference in, in, patient, in patient care and evaluation. Are you one of the chiropractors who still believe in doing x-rays? Yeah, I mean, of course, x-rays have a place in everybody's, you know, care. I mean, again, you know, you mentioned, of course, 
look him in the injury and, and assessing, you know, whether or not there's, uh, you know, uh, you know, a spinal ligament problem, which we assume. I mean, we assume that it's there. I mean, by definition, especially in, in let's say, a car accident, your 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 whiplash type accidents, the assumption is you've sprained a ligament. You may have sprained an anterior longitudinal ligament or a posterior longitudinal ligament, or you know, even the disc fibers are technically sprained. I'm sure you'd agree with that. And inevitably, you know, it's 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 nice to quantify these things. Um, I wish there was a little bit further along technology. I mean, you guys have a, a remarkable system that you do to evaluate, and I think you know it's gaining a lot of traction, of course. But I feel like sometimes, like I think the next evolution of what you're doing might be um, with MRI analysis. You know, so now, now you can you can you can really quantify ligament injury with with a with an MRI, and and that will probably revolutionize, you know, what you guys are doing, and 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 the evaluation and the prognosis. I think the prognosis is the the one thing that gets gets really cornered with the diagnosis of a sprain. Oh, I sprained my my neck. Well, a sprain of a neck can last six to nine months of being symptomatic, and you know this. We all have these patients who just you know, they're not better and then their, their findings just don't equate. And inevitably it's like you're, 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 you're kind of stabbing in the dark as far as what you're explaining to a patient. So, so quantifying ligament injury is really, really critical with, with these types of injuries. That's good. Cause when, when you're in, when your back is injured, uh, really there's two organ systems that can be affected, the bone or spine, uh, the vertebra, and we evaluate that with either x-ray, CAT scan, or MRI. And then there's the connective tissue, and there's two forms. There's disconnective tissue and non-disconnective tissue. So the MRI is great for disconnective tissue. But other than the upper cervical where you do specialized studies, proton density, you really can't evaluate the, the ligaments. And one of the, you know, there's a number of problems in using MRI to evaluate what spinal kinetics is CRMA or x-ray. One, unless you do it on a phone or they're not, not upright. And two, um, the AMA says, you know, the guides to permanent impairments based on x-ray. And, you know, with x-ray, you have magnification factors and, and, so, and uh, DPI dots per inch. And our software takes that into account. Whereas MRI, those numbers aren't worked, aren't worked out, whether you do it on a phone or a three Tesla unit, all those numbers be different. So, and also the AMAs, the impairment guides is based on X-ray, uh, not on, you know, MRI. So, you know, there's, there's been some, you know, I think Dr. Khan out in, in California developed some programs, but again, you know, you need general consensus, which the AMA guides is general consensus. And there's no consensus on using MRI to do what we're talking about, assess for the spinal ligaments. Down the road, maybe, but, you know, x-ray has been around and the guides, you know, the x-rays use in the, in the guides per impairment been around since 1990. So it's a standardized test and I've testified, you know, in New York. So it's, it's passed what's called the Dalbert and Fry challenge. It's not novel, it's accepted technology. And, you know, our, our national company has doctors refer cases in from you know, all over and locally in New York and New Jersey refer to us in, in New Jersey. And, you know, we've had thousands of doctors refer to us. And, you know, the, the Dr. Kronk's developed a standardized protocol how these patients should be worked up. The nice thing about CRMA, it's like a Swiss Army knife because the information can be used by uh, people that do manipulation, chiropractors, osteopaths, physical therapists. Can be used by pain management doctors. Can be used by regenerative medicine doctors. Uh, Doctor Santani, uh, Santano is actually injecting through the mouth uh, uh, elements into you know for the avar and apical ligaments to repair them. So I think you know the future is regenerative med you know chiropractic manipulative therapy and regenerative medicine um, is definitely going to be the the wave of the future if it's not already starting. Uh, and, wow, that's great. You know, first you have to diagnose and then you treat. And, you know, there, there's some members of your profession are starting not to do x-ray, which, you know, it, it, to me, it's, I can't phantom it. 
know, certainly if the patient has been in a motor vehicle accident and you're considering, you know, whether or not the ligaments are involved, the only way you can really assess that is through stress radiographs, flexion extension radiographs. And you know that because you've used our services for years and, you know, it's an integral part of your evaluation of the patient to help direct further care. It's like, you no know, every other, you know, test, you know, our goal as radiologists is to answer the clinical questions posed by the doctor and help direct further care. So CRMA or computerized radiographic mensuration analysis that we do, you know, it's sort of gets into that. Uh, into that. So um, if, if I'm injured, you know, what, what are the biggest mistakes or misconceptions an injured patient coming to you talks about or does? Biggest mistakes. So the biggest mistake, I think, and I think this is a consensus, you can take this one to the bank, is that they leave the, the emergency room and they're being told, oh, you'll be fine, you know, a week or so. Oh, this is just a mild sprain. Oh, this is fine. I mean, I think that's the biggest misconception. I think these guys in the ER, again, and God bless them, they're trying to assess for, although this guy last night, I don't know how he slept through the cracks. But they're assessing for immediate surgery, immediate intervention, and, and obviously for life-threatening type of situation. So, so, so the the cleanup work of the sprain, strain, and the disc issues. I mean, that's left for us and PTs and you know physiatry people or whatever. So, I mean, I think that's one of the biggest things that people are in the misconception that they're going to be asymptomatic. And truthfully, I tell people. You know, if I see them within the first 10 days of an accident, I said, listen, this is a dynamic changing, you know, injury pattern that may may get better and it may get extraordinarily worse. And by next week, you may have a complete different symptom pattern and, and, and dysfunction. And, you know, interesting, one of the things I do a lot of um, like brain injury screening, you know, this is another thing that's left out in the cold, I believe. And it's it's amazing to me when we talk about memory and concentration problems and dizziness and light sensitivity and all the things that go into the concussion management of, of a case or a patient. And the next time they come see me, it's like, you know what? Now, I, you know, I, I couldn't sit in the room with bright lights or, you know, I forgot where I put my coffee and all these things become transparent to them, whereas it wasn't. So I think that that's one of the, those, those two things in particular that, you know, they, they, they're not aware of all the symptoms they're experiencing or how they're relative to the accident. And then just some of this misconception that they got kind of like a bump on their toe and, uh, you know, everything's going to be okay in a week. And, and that, that, that's, that's problematic because now these patients, a lot of people don't even see care. I mean, they don't see care. And then, you know, they may come to your office five years later with chronic injuries that, of course, are, are more difficult to manage. So, you know, I think I would say that's it. Okay, so let you know the uh, if we try to tie a couple of things, we, we were talking about X-ray, and you know if you go to the emergency room, there's a thing called the Nexus study or the Canadian rules where unless you have midline pain, uh, they're they're not going to do X-ray. If they think you have a fracture, they'll do uh, CT, but you know they're there to rule out catastrophic injuries, you know, in their defense. But the problem is uh, majority of patients, probably 95%, don't have catastrophic injuries. They don't have fracture. They don't have spinal cord injuries. And they get turfed, you know, to the outside, you know, go see your general practitioner, whatever. And they, they kind of forward pace the patient to expect that they're going to get better, as you mentioned, without, you know, telling them that, you know, I don't see anything grossly wrong, but we really didn't evaluate for this, that, and the other thing. And, you know, that's my, you know, you have, you know, motor vehicle accidents, you have falls and you have concussion patients all being discharged and to the cloud, I say, because there's no, and I've been pushing for having a step down unit or subacute trauma center where, you know, people, doctors are properly trained how to evaluate these three subsets of patients that are underdiagnosed, undertreated and lead to a lot of chronic injury and pain down the road, you know, musculoskeletal, you know, talking about spine, you know, if you don't pick up spinal ligament injuries, it's the leading cause of chronic pain. And people can pay up to eleven to $12,000 a year, you know, to treat this. And it, it, it causes 
accelerated degeneration. Um, and, you know, if we can diagnose it early, uh, we can definitely properly treat them and certainly make a dent on the, the, the chronic opioid use and chronic pain. And it's all because of, of pain. Uh, it's all because we don't properly diagnose, properly treat early on. You know, the, this uh, epidemic or crisis can certainly be dissipated to some degree with proper evaluation and proper treatment early on. And I agree. I agree. Fire, yeah. but, you know, it, it's, 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 uh, it's sad that, you know, everybody's looking for the, the, the and rightfully so, what, what can kill you today in the ER. But, you know, pain can kill you down the road. You know, look at all the veterans that have taken their lives because of opioid. You know, no, agreed. And again, I think that's just the the management there. And again, you know, from a chiropractic standpoint, you know, the the management from there. And there's been a push in some circles to have chiropractors as quote unquote primary spine care deliverers. I think that's a great idea because you know we're very sensitive to these type of things. So you know, when you have that that acute whiplash, acute you know you know, a, a acute back sprain, whatnot, you know, it should be seen by us first. And we can certainly triage to the orthopedic spine guy at the right time or the physiatrist at the right time, or whatever the case may be. It's a good idea. I mean, because we, we are adept, to, you know, technicians to, to, to handle a case directly once it's been cleared of acute, you know, emergent care. You know, I mean, that, and that's the thing. Rather than them saying, oh, go see your primary care, what is a primary care going to do? Here, here's some pills, you know, and inevitably it, it's, it, it gets fumbled. The ball gets fumbled and they're lucky to sometimes get to the right specialties, you know, and, and, and that's, a, that's the biggest problem I would say. Well, along those lines, I, I was interviewed by Mike Carberry, uh, advanced medical integration, you know, last August. And, uh, you know, I also listened to an interview he had with Grant Cardone prior to Grant investing in his company. And they, they, you know, the, the model was you go to a doctor with pain, he gives you something for the pain to make the pain go away, not to diagnose what's causing the pain, but to make the pain go away. And that led to the opioids and all that stuff. And Mike realized that, you know, in, in order to get more patients to chiropractors, you know, only 10% of patients use chiropractor. You, you had to have a medical model, you know, a medical integrated model, but you know, I talked to him, I said, Mike, you know, the one problem I have is, is if the chiropractors get assimilated into the practice where they can't do what they do best, you know, their unique ability is, is the spine and treating the spine. And you know, he says, no, you know, we definitely put the, the chiropractor out front when it comes to the spine. And, uh, you know, as you mentioned, the, the use of other specialties, you know, it, it's funny, um, they just published a book about the AMA versus chiropractor, uh, chiropractors going back to the Wilkes versus the AMA. Oh, and, you know, it, it's, uh, and I, you know, I remember back when I was at Union Hospital, there was a letter circulated. We couldn't take referrals from chiropractors. And luckily, you know, one, you know Dr. Litter, you know, who was a Dagbart, uh, and his son was actually an osteopathic resident at the time, came in. And, uh, you know, it, it was almost criminal to be associated with chiropractors back then to the point now where I think, you know, part of the problem is that chiropractors still view themselves as victims instead of victors. And, you know, they, they should take the high point instead of, you know, woe is me, you know, I'm, I'm just a lowly chiropractor. You know, they, they should take the hill uh, and it's rightfully deserved. And, you know, it's just. I think, you know, one of the nice things with Mike's practice is he have, you know, the, this multi-specialty practice under one roof, but that's not to take away from uh, other chiropractors like yourself that have developed strong bonds and relationships and referral patterns with other specialties, pain management, you know, orthopedic surgeons that um, view you as an equal instead of, you know, just a feeder to them. You know, that, that's another, you know, story, you know, years ago, uh, going back, you know, most radiologists didn't want to read personal injury cases. And then when the faucet got turned down, as turned 
off by the insurance companies. Now everybody wants to do personal injury MRIs. And, uh, you know, I always say I was a friend to your profession before MRIs were even invented. Um, and uh, only because the, the radiologists found that the chiropractors could refer MRIs and they could make money off the, you know, the MRIs. Now chiropractors are everybody's best friend. Right. So well, that's a bureaucracy, Steve. And that's the whole that's, that's the whole bit. Right. So, I mean, inevitably, that's the downside of the whole the whole thing. It's. It becomes that's that that's what becomes practice debilitating is when you're shrouded in in that type of a situation. Uh, absolutely, but you know, I, I think that the, there's a brighter light now. Um, I think uh, everybody has better understanding of the capabilities of each other, and I think there's more respect. Like I said, it, it, the the victim, not that there's not still you know. Like in Texas, where you know they're still coming after the chiropractors, but I feel that the main uh, adversary is your own people in your own profession. <laughs> you got that right. You know, it, it's uh, you know, one of my friends. Uh, you know, I think in Parker they were talking about having two pathways. One includes non chiropractic manipulation, not teaching it. You know, which is like osteopathic manipulation is an elective now. You know, so, you know, it, it's, you know, all these years, you know, chiropractors want to become like real doctors. You are a real doctor. You know, you, you help people. What else do you need? Yeah, you know, reimbursement may be different. Well, just do more adjustments. You, you know, you can, you can find ways, you know, you can, there's three ways to grow a business. Get more patients, have them come more frequently or do more procedures on them or, you know, give them, uh, you know, you know, something that, that, that will help them that you can supply, whether it's uh, a cane or, or brace or new, neutral pharmaceuticals, whatever there, there's, but the bottom line is you're, you're there to help people and you do help people. And if you make it more convenient for them, so they don't have to go everywhere for that, all the better for them and for you. Sure. So um, we didn't get to the medical legal part. I don't think. <laughs> Listen, but, uh, it'll take two hours. Yeah, I told you. I told you I'll sit there and ramble for four hours. Oh, uh, that, that's good because, I, you know, it, it's, you know, to me, you know, podcast is it, just a conversation between two people. It's nothing more than that. Two and, old friends. And, I, you know, I think people will get, you know, useful information out of this. They'll be entertained. And plus, I had fun. So even if they don't get anything out of it, <laughs> but, uh, you know, let, let's uh, shift gears a little bit. You know, sports medicine. Um, I know you were the, the chiropractor for uh, a college, and also you still deal with a lot of uh, athletes now, both uh, professional and weekend warriors, so to speak. So what, what common things should people avoid doing or should they do? Or, you know, what kind of tips can you give them to, you know, be, be either a better professional or not come home limping, limping to their wife and the wife said, I told you not to, you know, play basketball or whatever. And how are you going to take out the garbage? Well, well, of course, you know, the, the basic Steve would be, you know, preparation. And, and this goes beyond just sports. It also goes into people's daily activities. Right. So sometimes, you know, if you look what professional athletes do and how they prepare for a game and they stretch and they do some warm ups and some ply, you know, plyometric type activities and they're training, Whatnot. So these these are your your athletes who are at the you know the frontier as far as you know sports medicine and sports training. So <clears throat> if you take their example, listen. If you're going to sit at a desk eight hours a day, you got to warm up. You got to stretch a little bit. You got to make your spine a little bit more pliable so that you don't stagnate by the end of the day. Just like with sports, you know, if you're going to be a weekend warrior, you're going to play like like I, I still play ice hockey which uh, for better or for worse, Steve, it might be on the way out soon. Who knows? Um, but needless to say, you can't go into that cold. You're 45 years old, 50, I'm 35 years old. You can't go into a cold. You have to warm up. You have to stretch. If you have a back problem or a neck problem, you have to be leery of what, what you're doing in that particular sport and not think everything's going to be wonderful the next day or the next two weeks. So, so you have to just be smart. You know, it's, uh, you would never tell a, an athlete or, or a pseudo-athlete uh, to not do their sport, but you have to be smart at it. 
you know, and know your body's limitations. And the, and the one thing I will say is is also your training. Your training better be intelligent. You know, if if you've never, for instance, if you've never done a deadlift before, and some some people have been high on doing deadlifts and training for specific sports. If you don't do it right, you're going to injure yourself deadlifting. And and unfortunately, I've seen a lot of student athletes who've certainly had back issues, probably because of poor form when they're deadlifting or you know, a gentleman, gentleman the other day, he, he was trying to squat and I'm watching his form. I'm like, who taught you how to squat? And he was, he was a former, you know, high school football player. I'm like, who taught you this? I mean, you, you're going to get injured training for the sport you want to play. So again, preparation with everything is it's critical. And again, whether you sit at a desk for eight hours a day or you're going to go play, you know, men's league hockey and try to pretend like you, you know what you're doing, you you have to prepare. So that would be the lesson here. Great. So if, if patients want to get hold of you in New York or New Jersey, what's the best way for them to get hold of you? So honestly, going to our website, advancedbackandneckcare.com. I mean, that's the easiest. And there's, there's you know, there's actually an online scheduling system. Um, there's an email. I mean, my email is accessible. I mean, you know, uh, I only... You know, I, I don't you know, listen. I take emails at any time of the day, but but for the most part, you know, we, we try to get back to people as soon as possible. Uh, of course, in the phone phone lines, you know, in New Jersey it's six zero nine two six one seven five six two, and in New York it's seven one eight nine zero four zero nine zero eight. And I'm always accessible. So I mean, you know, it's uh, it's easy, and we have great staff in both offices who try to make it a, a pleasurable patient experience. Oh, that's great. Well, like this staff right here. <laughs> great. Well, as always, it's been a pleasure, buddy. And uh, look forward to talking to you in the next couple of days, uh, catching up. And I appreciate your time and, and appreciate what you've done for your patients and your profession. You're a true star. I appreciate it. Thanks, Stephen. I, I apologize for rambling on your podcast for, for, for way too long. No, no, no. It's been great. Take care, my friend. See you, Steve. Thanks for tuning in to the Dynamic Radiologist podcast. Make sure to click subscribe to get updates on our latest episodes.